Okay, it's two minutes after. We'll probably have some more people join, but uh, let's go ahead and get rolling because I want to give Heidi as much time as possible. Uh, our guest speaker today is Heidi Musamba from Brookdale Senior Living. Uh, Heidi's, you know, as I said in my emails, uh, she's been working with seniors for 23 years and has a treasure box of safety tips and advice that she can help everyone uh, with. And so we hope that at the end of this, you'll be able to provide better care for your loved ones. And you'll also feel a little bit better about how you're doing it, right? You'll feel more confident. So uh, let me turn this over to Heidi and uh, there we go. Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you find this beneficial. This is all for you. So um, I'm hoping that this will be a very interactive experience. Um, I really encourage you to use the chat box. Mike has offered to monitor that for me this morning and help with asking questions. But if that's something you're not comfortable with, I know um, some people are more comfortable with Zoom and all the different aspects uh, than others, then uh, please, um, if your face is on, you can just wave your hand and let Mike know to unmute you, or you know, if you're not uh, showing your face this morning, um, you can uh, just unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, I will also reserve some time for questions at the end, so if you have other questions, but I am going to be asking for participation this morning. So I really think that hearing uh, your ideas and what things you already are doing, knowing, exposed to. Um, and, you know, there's definitely going to be things probably I haven't thought of. So, you know, just uh, if you have those suggestions, ideas, uh, great. And it sounds like we have probably memory care experts right now on the call and people that are just learning um, more and more about memory care and maybe experiencing it. So a very wide audience, it seems like so far this morning. So I'll try to speak to everyone. Uh, but again, please don't be afraid to offer your input. So any questions for me before I share our slides this morning, we get started? Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, yeah, so perfect. Fine. Okay. Okay. Okay, can everyone see the screen okay? Yes? Okay. Yes. So as um, Mark mentioned, I'm Heidi. I'm with Brookdale Senior Living currently. Um, I've actually worked in various parts of the state in my career caring for elderly, including the Milwaukee area, the central Wisconsin area, and um, the Madison area most recently. So um, pretty versed and have had multiple roles. And I don't want to go into that too much, but just in kind of general, I've done everything from caregiver to executive director um, for assisted living. Um, and I've done a lot of things with skilled nursing, home health, those sorts of things. So I'm not gonna, I mean, that's not the purpose of the presentation today, but if you have questions specific to those areas as it relates to safety, when to consider things, that sort of thing, I'm happy to uh, be a resource for you in that regard. I also host a support group for the Alzheimer's and dementia uh, or sorry, Alzheimer's Association currently. So if you um, need a support group or need uh, that structure, that's something we can talk about at a later time. I'll make sure that Mike has all my slides today as well so you can reference them uh, for future. So here we go. Okay, so um, safety tips for those living with dementia. So today we're gonna talk about what things to consider in the home, how we can remain safe when we're outside. Um, driving always comes up, so just wanted to talk a little bit about things to think about when you're uh, deciding if it's still safe to drive or not. Um, what does verbal, verbal and physical aggression potentially pose as it relates to either the person with dementia uh, having situations and behaviors or um, the person who is maybe put in the place to be a caregiver or, or other family or friends that might be around but necessarily aren't the caregiver, maybe having some struggles with dealing with that person. 
And then having a plan, uh, so making sure that everyone is on the same page and that you continue to evaluate your plan, and then making sure that you have some helpful resources. So um, we're going to spend some time talking about all those things. So this, oops, I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, so for, oh, sorry everyone, skipping on me here. Okay, so I first want to um, just share just some thoughts. So for caregivers, I think keeping a loved one safe in their home can be a challenge. This can definitely lead to exhaustion and endless worries if the right processes and tools aren't in place. And for the person who has dementia, the inability to recognize your home and the feeling of being lost can be very scary and can also kind of lead to other issues, concerns, behaviors, etc. And so Today, we're just going to try to focus on how can we minimize those things and make those things easier for everyone involved. So for the home, um, I want to think about the different areas in the home and start talking about what might make those areas uh, a safer place for loved ones. So is somebody able to share with me um, some items in the bathroom that you think you may want to have in place for the safety of your loved one who has dementia. Anyone want to share? Some things that you might do or you things that you think could be a concern? No? Well, I'm going to list a few and if you think of anything, please chime in. We got uh, a few come up, uh, Heidi. I noticed from Serena, grab bars and slip grips are often things that you should uh, be considering. Perfect. So uh, those are great ideas. Yeah. And I thought, well, you know, I'm always tripping on the rugs in my bathroom the way it is. You know, what if I were, uh, you know, having, you know, dementia problems? It would be even worse, I think. So. Yeah. So one of the things I, um, there's a lot of information that goes out about rugs and I do feel that, um, you know, avoid them as much as possible, but possibly having one uh, rubber backed, you know, memory foam style rug uh, to step out when you get out of the shower might be a little bit helpful um, because the, it is so slippery and persons with dementia don't always think to wipe their feet before they step out. So um, having something a little bit safer to step onto but yes, all the rugs around the base of the toilet, all the rugs around the front of the sink, those sorts of things, please limit those as much as possible. Um, not only uh, can there be mobility things that happen with dementia, but there can be vision things. And so having more things to trip on um, can be very challenging. Um, there's items uh, also, uh, just having a shower chair, I think can be extremely helpful. Um, making sure that you're checking kind of on your loved one, uh, especially if they're progressing more in their dementia, because um, I've heard many times where, you know, a person is shampooing their hair every day and now the shampoo is something that they're putting in their hand and eating or something like that. So just be aware that even in your bathroom, there's chemicals there. And even if you have all your Windex and other things locked up, um, you know, those other items can be help harmful. Um, I also suggest that when um, buying toiletry items, you look for natural products, you look for products that um, don't have a lot of chemicals in them, so that if something were to happen or they were exposed, that uh, we can keep them safer. For instance, um, there's very good fluoride-free toothpaste. So the um, poison in the toothpaste is the fluoride, and so, you know, we think of it as buying it for our children fluoride free, but there are adult versions of fluoride free toothpaste, which avoid the exposure to fluoride, uh, which would be much less harmful if they were swallowed or ingested or that sort of thing. So um, I think that uh, one other thing I saw when I was kind of um, doing a little bit of additional research for today's presentation is there was a recommendation to pad um, the faucet in your, uh, on your bathtub. Um, and they suggested this because if somebody did fall, that's often where they may hit their head. 
Um, and so having extra padding would hopefully prevent a significant of injury. So I thought that was interesting. And then one real key one, um, the, the temperature of your water in the house, uh, there was suggestion to make sure that the temperature does not exceed 120 degrees uh, by resetting your thermostat. So um, I think that's great for the bathroom, but also great for other areas of the house, such as the kitchen sink and that sort of thing. And it looks like there might be some more comments coming in. Yeah, Heidi, I noticed that uh, Marla put up that uh, height might be a consideration. Short people, you know, if you set your grab bars too high, they'll have difficulty. Maybe it's difficult to get into the bathtub. Uh, what are some considerations for the height of the person? So I think, um, yes, placement of grab bars is key. Um, involving a therapist uh, is not a bad idea to help you get that set up appropriately. So having your physician make some, uh, write some orders to maybe have a OT or PT person come into your home, occupational or physical therapy, um, to help you assess, you know, where is the safest place to put the bars. Um, but if nothing else, just practice with the person who needs them to see, um, you know, if they reach out, where is the most comfortable place for them to reach. And so you're making sure that you get them. Also make sure that they're studied appropriately. Um, so you certainly don't want somebody grabbing onto something and it letting go from the wall. So um, just having some help with that, I think is sometimes important unless you're real handy. Um, the other thing is uh, toilet seat raisers. So um, making sure that you have a raised toilet seat if appropriate so that it's easier to get on and off the toilet. And the one final thing I wanna mention is colored toilet seats. So for some of our residents, we, have actually, we actually have put in red toilet seats. Um, you could also do black, but you want a contrasting color. If they're colorblind, obviously you want to avoid red and green. Um, but the reason for that is, say a gentleman goes up to the toilet and wants to use the bathroom, um, it does help if they're having visual difficulties for them to be able to determine where the appropriate place is to go to the bathroom. So people might say, well, I just clean up the mess if it happens. However, if you don't clean up the mess fast enough, that creates another hazard for them because they can slip and fall uh, in the wetness. So um, I think that that is another trick to the trait that you may want to consider in the bathroom. So, How about securing medications? I know Bruce uh, Beckman just uh, sent in a note saying secure medications and over-the-counters. How do you do that? I mean, you lock it up in a safe or what? Yeah, so can I come back to that one just a little bit? Because we're going okay. um, to talk about that a little bit more. Um, okay, go ahead. So we're going to go into the kitchen. So as we think about the kitchen, um, we've kind of talked about just the different things. Again, I know people put rugs and things by the sink. So kind of the same generalized things apply for every room in the house. But then there's some things that you might find in the kitchen that could propose, uh, propose additional risks. So definitely you want to monitor any appliances, any hot surfaces. Um, you want to be sure that you're having the ability to um, unplug the stove or remove knobs um, if the stove is something they're attracted to. Um, making sure that, you know, if you have a dishwasher that, you know, they're they're okay with the way the dishwasher works. If that changes, you know, you probably don't want them opening it and letting releasing the steam and touching all the hot plates uh, right away. Um, you know, there is uh, other appliances like a microwave. You know, a microwave is very simple in and of itself, but if somebody loses the ability to use the microwave, uh, you can have a fire in your house real quick. So um, just making sure maybe if you're not using it that you just unplug it so that they're not attempting to use it when you're not looking or maybe are busy with something else. Um, you wanna be sure that your sharps are locked up, um, similar to like you, what might you, what, similar to what you may do for children, uh, making sure that drawers or cabinets that have sharp objects or chemicals, dish soap, anything like that, um, that they have a latch on them so that, uh, or even possibly a lock if, if they figure out the latch. Um, you have to do what works best for your situation, but um, you do need to make sure those things are secured or just find another place in the home where you can better secure them. 
and um, utilize them when you need them. Um, you don't want to have uh, just things sitting out so much. So, um, you know, but I think you still want to give them some freedom. So let's not, you know, it's, it's about keeping them safe, but it's also not about taking everything away. So you want to make sure that you have drawers that are safe for them to go into if they're a kitchen person, they've always been in the kitchen. Uh, make time that they can be with you and cook with you and prepare things when you're observing and watching. Um, if unloading the dishwasher is appropriate, you know, make sure it cools off and give them that opportunity to participate in those things safely. It's just those things that really make a difference in um, not always focusing on what they can't do, but what they can do. And that's so huge. Uh, also keeps them busy and keeps them out of other uh, things that might be more dangerous for them. Um, bedroom. Well, actually, before I go on, any other comments or concerns about the kitchen? About electric versus gas stove, is there any difference there? Um, that's a good question. I know some stoves have now where you can get the features on them where if something's not on the burner, it automatically like shuts off or cools off. Um, you know, gas stoves are more of an open flame. So, uh, you know, that might be a little more risky. And so with some of the electric stoves, they do have that auto shut off. But ultimately, I think it's just, if you're not comfortable with them going to the stove, uh, both usually offer the opportunity to remove knobs. Um, it's not easy to reach behind the stove to unplug it, but it might be necessary to do, especially if you're leaving a loved one alone in the house for periods of time. Um, just to make sure that they're not going to that stove to use it. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Bedroom, what about a bedroom? What things do you think about when somebody might be sleeping in a bedroom? So when I think of the sleeping hours, the first thing I think of is a well-lit area. So even though you want it dark when you sleep, um, you know, if you have an adjoining bathroom, maybe leaving the bathroom light on or offering up a night light. Um, sorry, my nose is just itching. Um, and making sure that, you know, those options are uh, available and, and in place um, so that when it does get dark, they're still able to see their paths and see their way to the bathroom. The other thing um, that comes to mind is just being sure that, uh, they're not wandering at night. So what do you do? How do you, how do you help with that? How do you control that? Um, so some things to, that people have done is if you're sleeping in the same room with them, um, then maybe you find a way to lock the door from the inside, especially if your bathroom is off your bedroom and doesn't require them leaving the room. Um, because if they're a big wanderer uh, and you're already in the room with them, then if they can't open the door, they're gonna to come to you most likely, um, or at least you know that you can sleep and they're not gonna walk out in the middle of the night and you're not gonna know about it. Um, other things are chimes, bells, um, if you wake up to those. Uh, there are uh, like magnetic things that you can install on doors. Um, so anything that you can do just to know that they're in that room with you, if that's the situation. If you're a person that's not sleeping in the room with them, um, using a monitor would be good. And still having an alarm on the door that you're able to hear would be good. Um, I would certainly not lock the door if you're not in the, from the inside, if you're not in the room with them. Um, so that's a safety thing, but I um, definitely would uh, consider using some of those other tools and resources to make sure that they're safe and secure. Um, and I'm not seeing the comments actively, but I did see a couple more people commented, Mike, so I'll just pause for a moment. A couple of uh, comments I brought up, uh, and some other people brought up, uh, falling out of bed. You know, and how do you decide on how high the bed should be? I mean, our bed is like four feet up in the area. You know, it's got box mattress and you know mm -hmm. a whole pile of stuff. How do yeah. you deal with that? So it really uh, depends on um, the person, really. I mean, how much of a fall risk are they? Um, if you have, if you're not in the room with them, you know, the monitor would help at least if you're kind of checking it a few times. 
Um, we don't normally recommend alarms because they're kind of startling, but for some people in situations where that's a concern, uh, there are uh, alarms and mats that you can put on a bed that don't ring to that person, but they just ring to wherever you want it to ring to. So if you were sleeping in the bedroom down the hall and they were in that bedroom and you wanted to know if they were getting out of bed, you could put like a pressure mat on their bed and then have a situation where that rings to you in your bedroom that you're in so that you can monitor them. Um, you could also consider a, a low high low bed um, that has an adjustable height. So if you're caring for someone in maybe later stages of, of dementia or somebody that has less mobility, but still is trying to climb out of bed that if they do so that they're safe. You consider a mat next to the bed. So high low bed, mat next to the bed. And they also have these new fangled dangled beds that I just learned about actually within the last month. And um, I forget the name of them, but they actually go to like floor level and they have a mat that kind of goes off the, the, the edge of them. And they are like super cool. I mean, it's almost impossible to fall out of the bed because if you fall, you're rolling. You're rolling onto a mat. So um, I think they're called zero something beds. And I'm sorry, I, I'm forgetting the name, but I could definitely get that to you, Mike, to share with the group. Um, so those are some things that I found to be to help with um, bed safety. If somebody, though, is getting up at night to go to the bathroom on their own, and they're overall pretty safe with that, you want to make sure that if they're using any mobility aids, that those mobility aids are close to their bed, that you have the walker near them, that you have the wheelchair near them, not so that they can't swing their legs around and get out of bed, but so that they can safely get to and from the bathroom. Um, finally, there are some items that can help with bed mobility in and out of bed. Um, there are some recommended items, and then there are some items that might be considered unsafe for choking hazards or reasons. So um, things like a halo bar or a pole that goes from floor to ceiling are typically suggested as being more safer options than some of the transfer bars uh, and or bed rails, which, um, you know, if the person is not being supervised quite closely, uh, would be suggested not to have on their bed. So uh, those are things to think about as well for mobility and, and safety in that regard. Any other how thoughts? About, how about the locks on the doors? I mean, uh, I remember a buddy of mine, we were, did, you know, he, his favorite thing was to lock himself in a room. Oh, <laughs> to, lock, to lock themselves in. <laughs> yeah, so, in. Um, I think that, uh, you know, depending, it really depends on the situation. I mean, maybe removing the locks is an option because if somebody is, um, you know, you don't really maybe need the lock on the bathroom door. But then for some people, you may leave the lock on the bathroom door because you've got stuff in there that needs to be locked up, or maybe you put the lock on the cabinet door. So, um, you know, or, uh, you know, if there, you know, maybe there's a way that you could make it so you can still lock it from the outside, but not from the inside. Um, some of them have the ones that you can pick lock with a hanger so that you always have a backup plan if, you know, you get locked in or locked out. Um, so there are different options. Um, I don't know if anyone else has other ideas since it was brought up, but that's kind of how I would have dealt with it. How about dressers that are too, uh, Marla brought this up, uh, dressers and other furniture that could be a fall hazard. They could fall on somebody. Yeah, so certainly anything like real tall, like a cabinet or anything like that. Um, you know, you could get anchors to anchor them to the wall and uh, put like a chain behind them. So if it's something wobbly or tippy, um, that's what I would suggest or removing it if it's not necessary. But uh, for most people, they would just buy a anchor and then anchor it to the wall. And you can get those at, you know, hardware store. Okay, good, thanks. Mm -hmm. So going to the living room. So um, when I think of the living room, I think about potential clutter. I think about seating. Um, those are things that come to mind. Um, and then kind of just the flow within the house. I mean, some houses have great sight lines and some don't. Um, so seating, they should have a chair that's easy for them to get in and out of if they're still mobile. 
Um, if they're not mobile, they should have something near their chair and hopefully they can request your help, maybe even a little bell or something if they need to get up. And if they completely don't understand either, then I think just whatever room you put them in, you just kind of want to have some sight lines whenever possible. So, you know, maybe the living room is no longer um, the living room or your sunroom is a better option because you can see it from your kitchen when you're doing things in the kitchen. Uh, you know, so just think about that, you know, every space can kind of be converted. And I know it makes things maybe look not quite as put together. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's important to uh, as much as possible maintain sight lines, especially if there's uh, a lot of fall risks or safety hazards related to that. Um, I also think that the living room is a place where we engage a lot of our day uh, for a lot of people. So uh, making sure that as much as you don't want a bunch of clutter and things for them to trip over and you want clear pathways, you also might want things just purposely lying out, a magazine for them to look at something for them to twiddle with, the newspaper that they like to read. Um, there's a, you know, a simple radio, like a one touch button radio that they know how to turn on and off. Um, simplify the TV remote. And this goes for any electronics in the house, even a microwave if they're kind of transitioning, you know, putting additional notes or signs on things to help them use things safely if they're still at that area where they're able to do that. Um, remotes could be very confusing for people. So getting a simpler remote um, so that they can still maintain that independence and uh, be feel busy and involved and engaged uh, throughout the day. Uh, so those are things that I think about when it comes to the living room. Also just watch for hot surfaces. Um, I know some people may even have like old wood burners still in their house for like a cozy fireplace in the corner. Um, just making sure that you know, if that's not safe anymore, if they don't understand that it's not safe to touch it or they're getting more confused about their surroundings or kind of feeling everything as they walk, um, that, you know, you're not using those items or mm -hmm. only using them when you're um, in true observation of what's happening. Um, anything else you can think of? How about large glass doors? You know, if it walked out onto the deck or patio, mm -hmm. Anything yeah. about large glass doors? So one of the things suggested is uh, putting signs on anything that's glass um, if they're having vision issues. Um, and like things like just taking a piece of paper and writing door so that they know that that's a door. Um, you can use those as reminders throughout the house for other things as well. Uh, but making sure that um, those are, and then, and then if you really have a wanderer, making sure that the doors are secured and making sure any windows uh, that you have in your home um, are also secured or that you put some sort of stopper on them so that they can't be open more than a certain amount. So like our windows here and our memory care, you can open them, but you can only open them about probably three, four inches so that um, they can still get fresh air but um, they're not going to be able to escape through a window if they really get, you know, to the point where they're that confused um, that they will, you know, try to go out through a window. So those are some other safety things. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, laundry room. Um, so laundry room, you mostly just want to worry about the operation of the washer and dryer. Uh, making sure again that if you need to remove knobs, you remove knobs, uh, making sure that this is a safe experience for them, that you don't all of a sudden have a flood in your house, um, making sure that you know they're not touching hot things within the dryer, trying to take things out. So uh, probably a good room to lock off unless your loved one is currently still engaging in the process of doing laundry. And then I would still be checking on them and again, you have your soaps in there, you have chemicals. Um, so making sure that those items are out of reach, um, if, if, that's a, you know, if that's the case as well, that those chemicals are locked up. Anything else, Mike, or comments as far? Uh, well, one thing uh, Serena pointed out, uh, possibly painting windows or decorating windows with paint in order to make them maybe, I don't know, more, more Serena, can you chime in here for a second? What was your idea on uh, window paint? Hmm. 
not sure what that was uh, about. So I think um, it's just creating a short, oh, she on? I, th I think uh, for me okay. it would be just um, creating some color and contrast because glass can be kind of hard to recognize and see. Um, That's what she's saying, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Make it a little brighter, make it uh, visible. Exactly. Okay. That's what I was thinking, but you know, I'm not, uh, I'm a pedestrian here. <laughs> and then stairs. Stairs are huge, right? Uh, with visual impairments, with often physical impairments, um, with even the ability to, for some people, maybe walk to a basement and not remember why they're there or why they went there or to even come back upstairs. Um, so I, I think stairs are just always something to be aware of, uh, making sure that you put appropriate safety features in place, such as a gate or something if needed. Um, you know, if it becomes uh, more of a mobility or vision issue, really discourage that use of the stairs. Uh, and, you know, having the stairs even be a contrasting color to the rest of the home might be helpful. Um, you just, you just really want to be careful when it comes to stairs. Uh, you know, it's such a huge fall risk for people. Um, so just a heads up on that. About irons. I know a person who loved to iron and even though she, you know, had dementia, she loved to iron. What do you do with the iron? I would try to control how hot the iron got. Um, depending on the, so some people that with dementia would very much be able to iron still. It's something they've done all their life. It's in their long-term memory. They recognize that it's not something that you touch, um, but it's just something that I would feel comfortable if I was a caregiver in the home, just being there with them. So maybe the, that's an activity that you do with them. And now instead of one iron, you have two irons and you iron with them, or you just kind of keep them in a place where you can see them as they iron. So if you're noticing that the safety uh, needs of that person are changing, that you can change with them. Mm -hmm. um, if they get to the point where they're that confused, where they just like to iron and they don't recognize even that the iron is turned on, then leave it off and let them iron all day. It's purposeful uh -huh. to them. It's, it supports what their needs are and, and makes them feel good. Um, you know, at that point, they're probably not truly recognizing how wrinkled something is and you don't have to give them something that's super wrinkled. Um, so you could just give them that um, thing that they enjoy doing. And to you, I, I know it's not maybe helping with ironing, but it is giving them purpose and allowing that opportunity um, for them to, to have that. Um, that's a question I actually have never been asked. I, I don't even know if like uh, there's uh, safety, maybe some safety features um, that you could get on iron. So I'd have to research that myself, but um, yeah. I would maybe. say just good observation. And uh, Marla mentions that you can get wrinkle remover, like Dove wrinkle remover spray and uh, then offer them a cold iron perhaps. Yeah, that would be a good idea too. Thanks Marla. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna move on just because I wanna keep cruising along here. If we are having some great discussions, which is wonderful. Okay, so we're gonna move outside. Sorry, it was delayed, so I thought it wasn't working. Um, and talk a little bit about just our outdoor space. So when I think about moving to the outside, I'm thinking about the doors, the garage, the, your immediate yard, and just your overall generalized uh, neighborhood. So um, doors, we've talked a little bit already about doors um, within the home. So a lot of the same things apply to doors going outside of the home. And I just think that, you know, if you're starting to notice those things related to wandering, talking to you about needing to go somewhere, um, not recognizing their home as their own home, uh, packing up items uh, like they need to go somewhere, they're going to travel or get somewhere, um, very easily disorientated to their environment, uh, things like being restless, asking repeated questions, looking for friends and family who have maybe passed away or are no longer there. Those are things that I would start thinking about when you think about somebody wandering. Um, and maybe really be a, kind of that turning point for me as to, okay, I wanna know if my loved one's going in and out. So at minimum, I'm gonna have a chime on my doors. 
And at maximum, if it's looking to be even a bigger risk, I'm gonna find ways to secure my doors, uh, put alarms on them, or uh, put an additional lock. So some people have told me that they've even put like, when they're inside with their loved ones, they've put like an additional padlock on their door so that if their loved one is trying to go out, they're not thinking about it because it's not in their long-term memory. And so they don't think to open the padlock. So they just go to the door and they try to open it and they can't get out. Um, so those are different things that people have shared with me over the years. And I'm gonna give you some um, great resources with some additional information related to um, different safety devices for things like the doors and in the home and that sort of thing. So um, also, uh, you know, sometimes people disguise doors. So they have posters and things that you can buy that fit over doors and they look like bookcases or um, they look like, you know, something else that would be a cabinet or something like that in the home. So you can actually get something like that, put it over the door and then, you know, that becomes something different to them than a door. Um, you may also want to look at uh, things like uh, do not exit or something like that. Um, sometimes that works for people uh, or even putting a sign up that even though it's not real, say like do not exit alarm will sound. Um, so you can do things like that, just signage and stuff too, if they relate to signage. So, okay, the yard. So um, outdoor air, in my opinion, is one of the most important things for all of us, uh, but certainly we want to be sure that it's safe. So uh, finding things for them to do in the yard to keep busy, I think is huge. Um, knowing kind of what their patterns are when they're outside is big. Uh, making sure that if possible, or if they are wandering and you're leaving them out, that you have a fence with some kind of gate that uh, is secured and that you're checking on them often. Uh, making sure that if they are doing things like gardening, that uh, they are able to manage those things appropriately, not eat the soil, not um, use the tools um, in a way that might be harmful. Uh, so there are things that you just have to watch out for. Um, if you have items outside like lawnmowers, um, push mowers, riding mowers, uh, those sorts of things, just making sure that it's still safe for them to use those things. Uh, for some people, they might be able to do that for quite a while because it's in their long-term memory, but it doesn't take long. It's kind of, in some ways, maybe a switch going on and off that they might be on that riding lawnmower and they might forget which is the gas and which is the brake or um, how to turn it on or how to turn it off. So again, a, a really oppor a great opportunity for that observation. Um, Okay, so we talked about the doors and we talked about the immediate outside places. Any qu questions or comments? No? Okay. Garage. So when I think of the garage, I think again of a lot of sharp objects. So similar situation to the kitchen, you know, maybe you lock off the garage, maybe you put things in a place where they don't know they are in a locked uh, storage cabinet or something. Um, you know, making sure that your chemicals, your extra gas cans, everything is secured. Uh, if you have guns in your home, making sure those are secured uh, in a cabinet or in a place where they're not sought out or recognized. Um, if you have a vehicle in your garage and your loved one is still determined to drive that vehicle, please make sure the vehicle is locked at all times and the keys are put away. If you have an extra vehicle in your garage and that was maybe their old vehicle, um, depending on the situation, we'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to driving, but uh, you may have to do something to disengage that vehicle. Um, so those are just things that uh, are general safety th uh, items for the garage. Also, don't forget, um, if they knew the code forever to your garage door opener, they still may know it. And so just making sure that uh, they're not, that's not an easy access for them if you're securing every other door in the house. Uh, just don't forget the garage door. And then um, neighborhood. So when you think about neighborhood, I think about, you know, often people are still going out for walks. They may even still be driving in earlier stages of dementia. 
And you just want to make sure that, you know, if they're walking, you're occasionally taking a walk with them, making sure that they still know their route, um, establish a route, you know, uh, see if you can get them in a pattern of doing the same thing each time so that uh, if they don't come back for a little longer than usual that you're, you know, going out to, to look for them, um, but still giving them that independence. Make your neighbors aware of what's happening, the ones you entrust. I mean, maybe there's some that you think they might be vulnerable to, but if you have those great relationships with your neighbors, make sure they're aware of the situation. Let them know that, you know, if uh, my husband Frank shows up at your doorstep and he's confused, this is what we're dealing with, and can you please just give me a call and I'll be sure to, you know, come, come see that he's okay. Um, or, you know, are you okay with, you know, welcoming in, him into the home if this starts to happen? Because I think he might seek you out as the person, you know, down the street that um, he, you know, if he gets lost, he may come to your door. Um, so you want to avoid those things as much as possible. But as people transition, things change. And there can always be a mistake made that leads to someone getting outside. So the more safety nets you have in place, the better. Uh, also, I think, yeah, don't overlook the opportunity to use some sort of a tracking system, whether it's through a phone, something you can put in their purse, if there's somebody that never leaves their purse behind, um, something that you can, uh, a watch that you can put on uh, that has a tracking system in it. I know for my kids right now, I have gizmo watches, um, but there's many different, uh, different opportunities, but they have tracking devices and they also have the opportunity that they can call people and they just have a quick push button on them. So they're really easy to call. Um, so again, observation, making sure you know their paths, you know their routines, you know their routes. If they're driving, take rides with them. Um, and we'll get into that more specifically. But does anyone else have anything they'd like to mention about neighborhood safety or any questions in that regard? I think just keeping, uh, you know, keeping your relationships with your neighbors are extremely important, not just uh, for helping a person who's, uh, you know, suffering from dementia or developing dementia, but just knowing your neighbors helps you to navigate life. I mean, it uh, really is important. So I hope, you know, I mean, sometimes it's, I know with some friends I had, you know, once uh, the relatives started uh, developing dementia, they became ashamed to take the person out in public. And pretty soon the relationships start to break down. People don't know each other anymore. And so I think it's important to keep, keep your relationships up. Don't you think, Heidi? Definitely. Um for many reasons, <laughs> not just safety, but for many reasons. Um, yeah. And you know, you never know that day too, where, you know, especially for spouses, um, something happens to that caregiver in the home, their loved one is gonna be lost. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more down the road here in other slides, but um, you know, the neighbor might be the first person to recognize that something isn't right. And so making sure that they're aware of the situation is, is a huge safety tool. Oh, we're going on. Thank you. Yep. No. Oh, I see what's happening. Let's move that over there. Okay, so we're up to driving, and this is the one I hear a lot. People are like, my loved one is still driving. I'm so afraid. What do I do? So, um, so driving, is it still safe? So I kind of threw out a bunch of ideas here about um, ways that you can kind of determine um, if driving is still a safe thing for them. So uh, have you taken a ride with them recently? Uh, what are you noticing? What are you seeing? Uh, do they become agitated or irritable when they're driving? Do you see their, that escalate from you know, when you're hanging out in the house to now when they're driving and they just seem overwhelmed. Um, do they still understand and read signs? Um, test them. Um, just say, oh, you know, I, I see that we're almost, uh, uh, oh, where is that? Where are we going? See if they see a sign, see if they can recognize it. Um, what is their reaction time like? Do they have good judgment when they're pulling out of a parking place or pulling into a parking place? Are they running into curbs, bumping into things? Um, do they confuse the gas with the brake? Uh, do they understand the shifter? 
Uh, do they have a good sense of direction? So when you're driving around with them, do they still know where they're going to get to everything? Uh, are they forgetting, you know, after they got in the car where they were planning to go or get two blocks down the road and get confused about where it was that they were driving to? To me, those are all kind of the red stop signs to, hey, we may need to consider uh, no longer driving. And so how do you go about that? That's the question I get often. And I think if it's a person that you can reason with, I think that some people can still recognize uh, that they're able, they're not able to drive any longer. And you may wanna take those opportunities where you can tell they're uncomfortable to just say, you know, it seems like you're really uncomfortable. Would you like me to drive for you? Or it seems like you're really struggling uh, with getting back home. You know, I really think maybe we should stop driving because what if you get lost one day that would be really scary and I would be really scared for you. Um, I think that there's no longer a need for you to drive because hey, we're always together and I can we can go together wherever we need to go and it would just make me feel safer for us and for people on the road that you just didn't have to drive anymore. Um, you know, uh, I can be your escort, you know, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Make it about the luxury for them. Um, and if you're not able to have those reasoning conversations, uh, then maybe it's getting somebody involved that they might listen to better, uh, that is not safe. And it may not be, you know, you as the child or you as a spouse, maybe it's a close friend that they entrust. Uh, maybe it's an attorney that you've developed a relationship with and they kind of go to that person as a trusted uh, person to give you good advice. Uh, maybe it's a doctor. Doctors are huge. Um, so doctors can actually uh, submit letters to the DMV, uh, letting them know that they don't feel that this person is safe to drive anymore. And then that letter will come to the house and they will have so many days to go be retested at the DMV to see if they may, can maintain their driver's license. And if they don't go for the testing, their driver's license will expire. So you can really use that resource as a re, uh, kind of a last result as, resort as well. Um, and so, so many opportunities um, to get help and seek help, but really important if somebody isn't safe to be driving for their safety and for the safety of others on the road, um, we need to remove that opportunity, but then not forget to provide them other opportunities and other ways to get around and other ways to still do the things that they wanna do or get the things that they wanna get so that it doesn't feel so much a, a, of a disadvantage to them and there's just a new way of doing that, whether it's family, outside resources, uh, places like RSVP, Metro Ride Transit System. I mean, there's other opportunities uh, for them to still get to go where they want and need to go. Um, and so making sure that that's set up for them, that they don't have to think about that um, is big. Uh, also, if there's somebody that just tries to go say out to the garage to start the car or something like that, either securing the garage door or making sure that the keys and things are out of reach, out of place. And if the fact that their car is still in the garage is just a, a irritant to them every time they see it and gets them agitated because they can't drive anymore, you may wanna consider removing that vehicle, selling it or putting it at a child's home or that sort of thing so that it's not that source of agitation and stress for them. Um, on the other hand, some people, if they didn't see their car sitting there, they would be very agitated and stressed. Uh, but as long as it's sitting there and they can see it, then they're okay with it. So um, different strokes for different folks. You kind of got to play around and see what works. And you know, if they're your close family members or friends, you know them best and you just have to kind of get to know the new them as the dementia continues to take, take over. So um, any questions about driving, any struggles, any Thing that I can be helpful with in that regard. Okay, moving on. Oh. I have a quick question actually. This is yeah. Dora here. So what if the doctor is not being helpful um, and keeps sending them to the DMV? Like I, if there is a client who is needing to have his license taken away because he's really not safe, mm -hmm. um, but no one's really being quite as helpful. Like, is there any other legal action that can get involved just to make sure they're not driving? Um, mm -hmm. 
like they're trying to talk to the DMV. They're very good at convincing the DMV that they're okay. Well, had had the as a person had to retest. Yes, and they passed it. They're yeah. Okay. Safe up their wives to drive. Do they have any family members or friends or uh, powers of attorney or anything like that? I don't think any POAs, and they won't listen to family or friends. Okay. Um, you could maybe make the police department aware. I don't know that they actually would physically be able to do anything at this point. Okay. Um, but you can at least make them aware that you took these steps and, you know, could they kind of keep observation or if you know kind of time, common times that they leave the home uh, because what they might be able to do is if they're not following the rules well or they're not driving safely, mm -hmm. they could start issuing um, warnings, tickets, that sort of thing, just to okay. kind of help manage that situation. Uh, they're not going to be able to do it all the time, but at least if they have a general oversight that you have right. concerns, um, you know, I think that's a big deal. And actually mentioning the police kind of rounds back to um, some of the other uh, things, even with like knowing your neighborhood, if you have a neighborhood police officer or uh, even just your local police department, it's a great idea to um, make them aware that somebody is living with dementia in that area um, so that if they do end up in a situation where they wander out one day, they're just better equipped and prepared to help that person. Um, that's great. But yeah, I think that's what I would do. I would just start with the law enforcement. And if there was anything more that could be done, they'd be able to advise in that regard. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Yep, you're welcome. Okay, so staying safe when behaviors arise. Um, so some behaviors can be very harmless in many ways, as long as they're managed well, and others can be very harmful. So, um, you know, certain behaviors are more maybe more of annoyances. And then we kind of go to that term, pick your battles, right? Um, and just kind of learn how to deal with it, learn how to redirect, um, you know, take some educational courses, learn how to interact with people with dementia. If you haven't had that opportunity already, seek out support systems, um, you know, get greater and better information, uh, practice those things. So um, those are the unharmful, um, things like, you know, some people may change their clothes frequently throughout the day. Um, some people may pace throughout the house. Uh, some people may load and unload the dishwasher 10 times a day. Um, some people may pull everything out of the cabinet uh, just so that they can look at it and see it or for something to do. So, you know, there's things you can either do to minimize behaviors or allow them to happen. Um, even though they might be more work for you or just kind of create maybe a greater annoyance in some ways, um, you got to decide how you're going to manage those. But what I kind of want to focus on today is those behaviors that could be potentially more harmful and, and more challenging to deal with. Um, first of all, you have to remember that the person that has dementia often does not have control of themselves or their situation. And so how we respond to things or react to things uh, often creates their response. And so they sense our emotions. People sense emotions before they sense words many times. And even if they're not understanding all of our words, they can often tell if we're scared, upset, sad. Um, they read those things and body language is huge. So if somebody is starting to maintain uh, verbally uh, behaviors, you know, verbal things are pretty, minimally harmful. I mean, they may hurt your feelings and they may make you feel awful, but then again, you have to control that. What's in your control? You have to say, you know, I hate hearing that. Um, I don't know things I've heard because um, people just get very blunt with dementia sometimes and they'll start swearing or they might call you a naughty name or they might um, tell you something that's not nice. And you know, or they may make you feel really guilty about something, um, but you just have to know that that's dementia and you just have to excuse it. But if it becomes something that's physical, that's where it gets really challenging. And um, I think, first of all, you just wanna look to see, is there anything that's triggering them? Is it happening a certain time of day? Are they in a certain room when it happens? Um, 
Do you feel that there was any tension leading up to that situation? Um, were they frustrated about something? Uh, then you want to look for underlying issues. Are they having a lot of pain? Um, is there something they can't voice to us that's really bothering them? So you want to look at you know, what's going on in here. And then also, is there any bodily things that might be happening that they're just not telling us about? Asking them, you know, are you in pain? Do you have pain here? You know, point to the area. Is your pain here? Is your pain here? Um, and see if they'll answer you yes or no. Um, check with their physician, have them worked up. Uh, you know, you just don't want those behaviors to continue on if they don't need to, especially as it relates to them being harmful towards you as the caregiver or themselves personally. Um, so, and then learn how to deescalate situations. Um, I put it in here as a resource at the end, uh, but Tifa Snow is a really great uh, trainer. She has lots of videos online about how to de-escalate situations. Um, and there's many other resources through the association, the alliance, uh, but her live videos are pretty interactive. She goes into character and I think she takes some of the worst situations and kind of shows you how you might be able to deal with them and de-escalate things. And so that's huge. It's really important. Um, and if you feel like you've lost control, remove yourself from the situation as long as that person's safe or sometimes even if they're not safe and call for help. So maybe it's a neighbor you call for help. Maybe it's a child that they respond to better. Um, you know, I've had situations where there's a couple living in a home and now the spouse is all of a sudden a stranger and they want them out and they're attacking them and they're, you know, fearful and they, if a child comes in and intervenes and they're that new face, they're able to get them calmed down and they're able to get them to a better place. Um, use the process of um, butting up. So if there's two people in the situation and they're really scared of someone. So for instance, if somebody thinks I'm doing something wrong to them and I'm the caregiver and the person with dementia feels that I'm um, done something wrong. Maybe I stole their money and they're really mad at me. Or maybe I, um, I'm not the person that they think I am and I'm the stranger in their house. And what the heck am I doing there? Um, if you can have another person come in and say to me, Heidi, get out of here. You don't belong here. And then I leave the situation and they can say to that person, okay, you're safe now, everything's okay. You know, let's go sit down, let's grab a cup of coffee. Um, you know, she's gone, I'll make sure you're okay. You know, a lot of times that partnering really helps because that is de deferring from that situation. So don't look at it as you're making that other person look bad. Look at it as de-escalating the situation and partnering together. And those are some of those great tips and tools that you'll learn as you start to spend more time um, learning dementia, learning what it is, and learning how to deal with it. Um, don't forget your body language. Uh, make sure you're entering their reality. Try to avoid arguments. Um, and have those partners and support systems. Um, they're so huge, and they're so helpful. Um, if this... Uh, situation prolongs, or even if it's something new that's never happened before, seek medical care and support. Uh, we have some wonderful, you know, and if it's not your physician that's being supportive to you, seek other help and support. Get a second opinion. Um, maybe consider one of the UW geriatric clinics. Uh, they, that's kind of their specialty. Um, if you have a family medicine doc, maybe seek an internal medicine doc that deals more with the elderly and dementia. Um, Find that person that's going to help you. Don't just say, oh, my doctor's not doing anything, and so I'm stuck. I'm not safe. Reach out to other resources. Call your local, uh, you know, all or support groups uh, for the association or for the uh, alliance. Um, you know, if you need to, call Adult Protective Services. I mean, we really need to make sure that everyone in the situation maintains their safety and just don't forget that that behavior is not in with their control. 
They don't deserve to be punished before that behavior. Um, but you just need to make sure that both of you are safe. So sometimes locking yourself in a room is an okay thing to do because you're just maintaining your distance and making sure that you're safe. Uh, but, but certainly, um, please don't react to their physicality in a physical way. And if anything, just learn self-defense so that if they are coming to you in a physical manner, that you know how to deescalate that situation. And those are things that nobody wants to have to think about, but they're real and they happen, especially with some of our more challenging dementias. And I just want everyone to um, know that there's support, there's resources, and um, there's great tools and techniques to learn how to better deal with those situations. Comments, suggestions? Okay. Great advice. So uh, we're, we're yeah. really running on time here, Mike. So okay. please go ahead. Okay, well, if anyone needs to jump off, fine. Uh, but I, I think we were at an hour, so I just wanna keep sharing what we have. Um, so here we just wanna really look at, you know, the whole idea of elder abuse. And um, kind of the crazy part about it is people think of that often being happening in communities, but unfortunately they're finding that a lot more of the elder abuse often happens in home settings. And probably because that person can be very isolated and there may be one or two people trying to deal with the situation. And some of it may be very unintentional and some of it could be very intentional. So when I think of unintentional, I can just think of things like um, being worn out, being exhausted and really um, reflecting back to them in a very negative, nasty way. Not even because you necessarily wanna be negative or nasty, but just because maybe you're not meant to be a caregiver. Not everyone's meant to be a caregiver or maybe you need better education, or maybe you need a break. Maybe you're just stressed to the max that you just can't respond to things in the right way anymore. And so don't be afraid to ask for help if, that, if that's you or you're that person or you're feeling like you're overwhelmed. But at the same token, there are some very deliberate things that happen from physical abuse to verbal threats to um, misuse of finances, and those things really do need to re be reported. Um, I definitely recommend, you know, contacting Adult Protective Services if it gets to that point, reaching out to maybe your Aging and Disability Resource Center for additional support or uh, someone to talk things through with. Um, you know, I just spent a, an hour on the phone with a person yesterday talking them through a very challenging situation and getting them to the right resources and coming up with a plan to get their mother out of a uh, unsafe situation uh, with unfortunately a child who has mental illness and is not treating the mother appropriately because of her illness that she won't get help with. So, you know, things like this happen every day. I had a coworker who just moved her mom into assisted living whose um, grandson uh, was uh, taking money from her and they had to shut down her bank accounts and reopen new accounts. Um, so, you know, it does happen. It's something to keep an eye on. If you suspect anything like that, start investigating, learn what you can. Um, make sure that you're protecting that person's safety and well being. And, you know, the sad part about it is, is this person was trying to do so much to get in contact with people and help people. And her mother was saying to her, Well, who's going to protect me? How come nobody's protecting me? And that's so sad for me to hear. Uh, but it is challenging because there's so many laws out there that don't protect us unless something physical has happened. Um, so, you know, really the key is doing everything you can to remove the person from that situation without there being any negative uh, effects on that person from the person creating the abuseful situation. So use the resources, reach out to people, start having conversations troubleshoot, get with other family members that can maybe help, but just don't let it go on. It's, it's so unfortunate that these situations happen. And so I just want to be sure um, that people are reaching out for help. Questions, comments? Okay. Okay, so plan, do, check, act. Um, I just think that dementia changes so much over time. And so what may be your plan today may not be your plan a week, a month, two months, three months from then. 
And so making sure that you know what resources are out there, that you develop a network of support, that you have an emergency plan, that you're feeling good about what that plan is. Um, and then as things change, readjusting over time, checking in with people, making sure they're still on board as your support system, uh, making sure that they still wanna act as the backup, uh, you know, healthcare POA or financial POA, uh, making sure that they know what's happening so that uh, and what the preferences are of that person. If you're somebody who has dementia yourselves, take the time to talk with family and friends when you still have that opportunity. Uh, make, make sure they know what your wishes are. What do you want your care to look like if you had your choice? Um, are there care communities that you might even like better for a living environment? Um, you know, how do you wanna live your life? What do you want that to look like? And then as a caregiver, just have those honest conversations and say, you know, I will do everything I can to carry out your wishes, but I need to be able to take control if what you're wishing for is not no longer an option. Making sure you have the appropriate documents in place, get your healthcare power of attorney, get your uh, financial power of attorney, make sure you have a living will. If you haven't done them in a long time, review them, make sure they're appropriate, make sure you have a good backup person. Um, sit down with an attorney, uh, make sure that your financial matters are in order. Um, Make sure that you have a plan for being able to afford care, or if you don't have the resources to afford care, that you've been in contact with the Aging Disability Resource Center and start establishing that relationship with them. But there's so many things that have to kind of be started and then put, in, put into action and then reevaluated. And so, um, you know, join support groups, have fun things in your day, make sure that you're connected to your local organizations that can provide resources to you. Now, I'm not saying you have to connect with all of them, but pick a few that you're gonna have that relationship with so that as things change, they can continue to support you and help you um, and have a list uh, of what those resources are. And then finally, just don't overwhelm yourself. So I think by kind of picking like a thing or two that you're gonna do each week um, to make sure that you're prepared as things change is a better plan than ending up in a crisis and now you need a lot of help and you're stressed already and then you don't have a plan. Um, we can't plan for everything, but we can plan for a lot of things and hopefully that will create a lot of um, decrease in stress and headaches down the road. And so this is just some thinking points about, you know, different things to check into um, and start doing. Um, and I, I always want to mention engagement for somebody with dementia is so important. Isolation is one of the worst things that someone with dementia can experience. And it's natural for them to self-isolate because they're fearful of interactions. They don't understand interactions. They may be fearful to leave their own home on their own. So just do what works to keep that person engaged. But do everything you can to make sure that they're not isolated or sitting in front of a TV for 12 hours a day. Um, because it's just really, really, really hard on that individual and they don't have the ability to recognize it. And you need to continue to create as many connections in your mind as you can. Um, and so when you think about keeping someone safe, keeping them engaged is one of the best things you can do to keep them safe because they're not thinking about those other things that might make them unsafe. So um, engagement is, is so important. So the Alzheimer's store is the store I mentioned to you earlier. And I found this store quite recently, actually. I had kind of always gone to different websites and just looking for different things like a chair alarm or like an alarm for the door or a, a watch to put on. But this um, website has so many things and um, you'll have access to this. You can copy and paste any of the links um, that I have in here. And um, this website is great for interactive things. For instance, if they can't no longer take care of a dog, but they've always loved to have a dog, they have what are called for real pets and they can really be a great companion if they get into those moderate to later stages of the illness. Um, so that's just one example. Or they have one button touch radios where if there's somebody that likes to listen to music, you, they can turn on the music by pressing one button and you can have it all pre-programmed in for them. 
Um, they have safety features. So there are so many resources on this website and I think they do a really great job of kind of dividing it out uh, and making it easy and accessible to find the things that you might be looking for. Uh, so I really recommend it. Just take a look at it, do a breeze through, get ideas. Um, it's a great idea uh, resource and you can purchase the items as well. So um, nice to have it all in one place. Uh, I did put down some additional links for resources. Um, if you're thinking of a different resource that you're looking for and you want uh, more information on something, please let me know. I try to pick out some of the most common ones that I end up sharing with people, um, but there are so many that, I mean, the list could be endless. So um, just wanted to make sure, Alzheimer's Association, Alzheimer's Alliance, great for support groups for your loved one that has dementia or for yourself, uh, memory cafes, um, abundance of resources. Um, this is the, the websites are, are pretty user-friendly. Um, you know, even when I was looking at some things today, I did review a couple things on the association website. And when you pull it up, you mean you really just click on a button as to what you're looking for information on, and it gives you a whole page of guidance. And it's so easy and help user-friendly. Um, they also have, uh, you know, case managers or contact people, resource people within those organizations. And they're really great at walking people through things being a helping hand um, so you can reach out to them. Senior centers. We have many local senior centers. So um, Verona has one, Middleton has one, West Madison has one, East Madison. So you can you know, contact those senior centers. Uh, if you copy and paste that link, it'll take you to a, all, a list of all our local senior centers. They're great on programs, engagements. Um, some of them host uh, support group type situations or memory cafe type situations where uh, they're providing additional programming, uh, but they have a lot of fun things to do. Uh, they often have meals, so getting your loved one out to socialize and go to a meal and have somebody that's checking in with them, you know, five days a week, that's huge. Um, Aging and Disability Resource Center, uh, they have case managers there that are meant for that purpose, to help people who are aging and have disabilities. Um, and they have the opportunity to also help with financial situations. So. Um, if you're someone who, you know, hasn't had that uh, ability to put away money for a long time and you need some care support, they're a great place to call to get some respite or some additional help. Adult Protective Services, you know, if you're in those situations that are dangerous or harmful, um, you know, give them a call, see what resources they have. Um, the Geriatric Clinic, great physicians for people living with dementia. Uh, that's one of their focus, their main focus is uh, caring for those who are aging with dementia. RSVP, great for additional volunteers, rides, um, supporting people and getting to and from things. Um, also, uh, if you need to adapt things like ramps or things in the home, um, sometimes they will participate in those types of projects. Um, SAIL, SAIL is um, staying active independent. Um, so, you know, that's a great program. Uh, maybe if you're in those earlier stages that you're just engaging with other people, having conversations. Jerry Psych, if you have a person like I talked about that's really having those behaviors and you're not getting resolutions, don't be afraid to ask for a Jerry Psych stay. They're wonderful people, they have psychiatrists there and they really help people get through those tough times often more quickly than trying to manage med adjustments and things in the home. So um, I just put Stone Hospital on there because it's the closest to our area, uh, but there are others as well in the state uh, that would be more than happy to help in those situations. And then Tipa Snow, I mentioned her earlier. Um, her videos are very helpful, even for things like getting a loved one to brush their teeth and keeping their teeth clean and healthy, um, which alleviates a safety risk for them because poor, poor oral health leads to other illnesses and things. So um, those types of things uh, are out there. And I just really encourage you, uh, if you're a person who is caregiving, kind of look at the overall, kind of pick where you're at right now, find a starting point and just start doing a couple things at a time or one at a time, just to make sure that, you know, you're not one of those people that's caught off guard and has to make a lot of uh, tough and challenging situation or decisions in very challenging circumstances. Um, so 
that's my that's my words for you today and thank you for listening any questions or concerns or additional information that you might like to have before we depart today let me jump in just for a second Heidi and I'd like everyone to take a second and fill out a little poll evaluation while you ask questions okay go ahead Heidi, if you like to, if everyone would like to chime in with questions and answers, go ahead, please. I would just like to jump in and say thank you for all the info today. Well, you're welcome. I'm glad you could join. And um, I did leave my resource information there as well. So if anyone uh, thinks of something after the call today and just says, oh, I wish I would have mentioned that to Heidi or asked Heidi, um, that is my direct cell phone number. And, email. So, you know, please ask a question, reach out. Um, I always say one of my favorite things to do is in my work that I do every day is make sure that I um, help families and help, you know, persons dealing with dementia get to a better place and have more tools in their toolbox. So um, let me know if there's anything more I can do. Mike, can you hear me? This is Bev. Yes, Bev, go ahead. Um, could you perhaps give people some information as well. Um, and thank you, Heidi, for mentioning about elder abuse. This is one of the main topics that Triad has been working with, and it's going to be a featured issue. Our conference um, programs that are coming up every Friday in October, and elder abuse is going to be our very first one with a national speaker coming in. And Mike, perhaps you could share some of that information with our participants. I can, yeah. So uh, the annual triad conference this year will be uh, each Friday. We, instead of canceling, we've decided to go uh, online, you know, using uh, GoToWebinar. And so every Friday from 10 to noon, we'll have uh, presentations by really fantastic uh, uh, presenters, the first Friday will be on elder abuse and we'll have Bonnie Brandell, who I think is pretty much uh, known nationwide as one of the uh, foremost experts in uh, elder abuse. And then Mike uh, Austin from the Department of Justice will also be giving an hour long presentation. So if you're uh, interested in signing up for the conference, go to rsvpdane.org and uh, you can sign up from there. That's great. I think that's one of the most challenging situations to deal with and some are even more challenging than others. So um, having whatever resources we can available to us is huge. And unfortunately, a lot of times until there's physical abuse occurring, law enforcement has limited ability to be involved. And that's the frustrating part. You know, um, I've been in situations where loved ones are being threatened with their lives and really there's so little that can be done to help them. And, that, and that's really hard and sad. And so um, hopefully there's a person that can intervene and get them to away from the situation into a safe place and they agree to go. But so many times they're so fearful of that person that's doing those things to them that it creates a very challenging situation. So it'll be a really interesting presentation. Well, there'll be plenty of other presentations, but uh, first let's everyone, whoever has questions, please unmute yourself and uh, take advantage of this opportunity. Um, I do have a question also for Heidi, if you could, um, especially during this pandemic, and you mentioned about isolation, where particularly people still are in their homes, and because we are being warned really not to be around a lot of other people or, or to go to perhaps dangerous locations where people are not wearing masks, etc. If you've got perhaps some additional, oh, uh, additional advice um, not just for people with dementia, but for elderly seniors too, to, to remain safe. Yeah. So I guess my advice to you is, you know, everyone deals with the situation a little bit differently. Uh, the recommendation right now is that if you're going out in public, that you should wear a mask and try to maintain that social distancing as much as possible. Um, I fear that too many people are being isolated right now. And I know it's happening because I have a lot of close contacts, even within home health organizations 
and they are telling me that people are waiting way too long or were waiting. It's starting to seem to change a little bit now, but they're waiting way too long to get help and seek help. And so I think, first of all, anyone that needs help needs to know that people are taking the appropriate precautions to make sure that when people are coming into their home that it's safe. For an elder person that needs to travel out of their home, I really just recommend that you wear uh, your mask and um, try to go during times that they've set aside for seniors if that's you know a big enough concern for you that you'd like to do that. Um, I also feel that the, the idea of isolating yourself in your home is not healthy. So pick a small group of people that you entrust, that you feel are going to take the same precautions that you're taking to keep yourself safe and develop that circle. Because um, especially for somebody living with dementia, I would sure hope that a family would not avoid going to see them because they're fearful that they're gonna give them COVID. Um, and I know I've heard people say, we're not going to visit our parents or our grandparents because we're fearful of giving them COVID. Take their precautions. If you feel more comfortable, meet them outside. Um, I just, we, I work in a community with 104 residents and you know probably 60 staff members. And we started wearing masks early on um, and practicing social distancing as much as we could in the common areas, which I can tell you does not happen in memory care because they don't understand it. And all of this time we've had one case and it was an isolated staff member and it was not passed on to anyone else. So I'm not, I'm not belittling the situation in any way. It's a very serious situation. But at the same time, use good judgment. You know, this is a, a flu virus. Unfortunately, it, uh, we're not as good at dealing with it yet, but it is a flu virus. And I'm sorry, just because I'm a health nut, <laughs> I can't leave out. Go to your local pharmacy, get them some immune support, get them some antivirals. You know, not the, not the pharmacy that you go to get your drugs, but your community pharmacy that can give you good support. Buy them some elderberry. Do the things that you can do to boost, uh, boost their immune system um, and help them be healthy and feel good. And I know that's not what we got in the call for today, but you know, boosting your immune system, using antivirals, um, and doing the things we can do to give our body the tools that it needs to fight things when we get them is so huge. So that's my little health nuts feel today. But um, I really do feel there's so much that we can do to take care of ourselves. And I do it for myself, I do it for my family, and it helps us stay healthy. And you know, why not do it? It's such a simple thing. So um, that would be my suggestion. And in, in addition to just really thinking about, you know, what's the worst case scenario? And if you ask my grandmothers, which one is 93 and one turned 80 this year, I called them both. They both live in Merrill. Merrill's had about 700 cases since this started, hardly any, the whole county of Lincoln. Um, and I said to them, can I still come visit you? And both of my grandmas said to me, you better come visit me. So, you know, everyone deals with it differently. Find your comfort level and use the tools that we have, build our immune systems, wear the masks, and develop a, a social network that you're comfortable with so that everyone feels supported is my best advice.